Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 159 of the movie Debrief. And today, folks, I want you to pop a squat because we're going to talk about the squat, common compensations that you may see in the squat. Yes, folks, if you are a butt winker, if you are someone who knocks the knees as you come out the bottom, if you're someone who gets stuck at the sticking point, whether it's on the way down or you're on the way up, your boy Big Z has you covered. Because your boy Big Z has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognize fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from my man, Manuel. Here's what he asks. Could you go over knee valgus during a squat ascent in the context of the model? For those of you who don't know what knee valgus is, knee valgus is basically where the femurs kind of knock into internal rotation as you come out of the bottom. It's a very common thing that happens. And so we have to look at why would that be useful? Why would the knees coming together like the Beatles song, but maybe not in a cool way always, be an advantageous thing to happen when it comes to the squat? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's dive into that. So when I'm coming out of the bottom of the squat, I have to put force into the ground. The force is strong with you. So I have to be able to put force into the ground in order to come out of the bottom of the squat. And when I'm producing force into the ground, that's associated with more internal rotation of the femurs, or just internal rotation in general. And so what will happen, if I look at this from a pelvis perspective, is internal rotation is going to be associated with the sacrum nutating or tipping forwards. That needs to happen. If that doesn't happen, well then guess what folks? You're gonna to have to find another way to do it. So when I push out the bottom of the squat, the sacrum nutates, that allows the guts and the viscera within the ventral cavity to actually be pushed upward, which that has to happen when you ascend out of the squat. When I'm dropping down into the squat, the viscera pushes down and that's why the pelvis ideally creates more of a vertical displacement because the sacrum attains a counter nutated position. When the sacrum attains a counter nutated position, it allows the viscera to drop downward. It catches the viscera effectively and life is good. When I come out of the bottom, I have to essentially push the guts upward because the guts are moving down. Well, I wanna move up, so therefore I gotta push the guts up. That's where sacral nutation is useful because that is associated with the exhaled position. So when you exhale, the, the position of the pelvis changes because that all is associated with altered contractile capabilities of the pelvic floor. That allows the viscera to ascend up and then you can come out the bottom. But folks, what if under a given squat, I can't do that for whatever reason? Maybe the load's too heavy because we oftentimes see knee valgus with a lot of our Olympic lifters. Uh, we'll see it when we're moving maximal weights. So then why would performing femoral internal rotation associated with knee valgus actually be useful in this particular strategy? If your body can't attain that nutated position, what will happen is you still have to be able to internally rotate. So you have to find a workaround in order to make that movement happen. The workaround in this case will be to anteriorly orient or tilt the pelvis. When you anteriorly orient or tilt the pelvis, that's going to allow the femurs to be more in a position of internal rotation. So I want you to uh, perform a quick little experiment on this to see it for yourselves. So if you watch me from the side, I'm gonna internally rotate my arms. You ready? So you see I have X amount of range of motion. Now, watch this. I can quick quickly pick up a boatload of internal rotation without doing a single stretch or anything. You ready? Boom. Wow, look at that, I got so much IR now. False. 
what happened, all I did was I changed the orientation of my forex. If I grab Ted, our boy Ted, good old Ted. If I just do this by anteriorly orienting or tilting the forex, that changes the position that the, the, the glenoid, that part in the, the scapula, or on the scapula where your humerus uh, connects with, it changes the orientation of the glenoid so it gives the appearance that there's more internal rotation available. And in fact, it does allow me to internally rotate, but it comes at a cost. When I perform internal rotation in that fashion, I'm not getting internal rotation at the glenohumeral joint. So I don't have the full movement excursion at the glenohumeral joint. All I've did was change the orientation of the thorax to allow that to pick up. So what's happened is now my humerus, my scapula, my thorax all move as one unit in order to complete the task, which under certain circumstances that could be useful. That might allow you to do certain things with your body that you might not have been able to otherwise, but it comes at a cost. When you don't have relative motion available between the bones, there's increased loading through certain joints because now you can't distribute the forces as effectively because there's fewer places to do so because you have less overall available motion. That's one thing. The other thing, is that when that happens, that could potentially increase stress on certain areas and, and, and cause issues. So that could be undesirable. Now let's apply that same concept in the context of knee valgus during the squat. If I grab my grandson here, I need to be able to internally rotate, which is nutation of the sacrum. I can't do that. So, if I anteriorly tilt the pelvis, like so, that changes the orientation of the acetabulum to where I have the appearance of more internal rotation. Is it real internal rotation? Not necessarily at the femoroacetabular joint. You've just changed the position of the pelvis to allow you to pick up more internal rotation but it's done so at the cost of preserving relative motion between the femur, the pelvis, back, etc. When that happens, then folks, you don't have the ability to distribute the forces across multiple joints. The bones lock into one place essentially and they move as one unit. And so there's a trade-off when you do have knee valgus on that particular squat. And it's probably why we commonly see that during heavier loaded activities. Because the more you push it to the limit, the less likely you are to preserve range of motion between all the joints because your body has to create a ton of tension in order to move something heavy or move quickly. So that's not uncommon, but that's why it happens is because your body's current strategy isn't enough so it changes the orientation to allow you to complete the task at hand. And that's likely why we see knee valgus with a lot of our squats, especially when it's heavier and ascending out of the bottom. Knee valgus happens with an anterior orientation of the pelvis. Not a good time in certain scenarios, but basically what's happened is you're able to produce force, but you've done so at the cost of losing relative motion between the bones. Now, our question is, is this problematic? That's the next question. And so what we have to look at is, well, is there any research showing that knee valgus during a bilateral squat is bad? Well, the times that we see valgus being bad in the research is when you're doing single leg squat testing. And the reason why that is is because that's associated with, or they use single leg squats to assess injury risk. And the second thing is when you are performing a single leg squat, if you get a lot of valgus in that position, it's also a, a position that is often associated with injuries in sports. So a lot of your ACL tears and things of that nature are usually because there's a substantial amount of dynamic valgus, and that could be associated with injuring specific areas, which is not cool. So, now we have to ask though, folks, is there 
an injury risk association with knee valgus during bilateral squats. And with a brief literature review, I didn't find anything either way. It doesn't appear as though there's evidence for or against bilateral squats and knee valgus. So that doesn't mean that it's a good thing, but that also doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad thing. We just don't know. But what I would say in that case is with absence of evidence, either way, we have to look at what is biomechanically desirable when we're performing something like a squat. And in my mind, there's four times or four things that we have to consider when looking at is this amount of valgus useful? Because we know, based on what we've just discussed about the biomechanics, knee valgus is gonna happen when there's a loss of relative motion that allows me to put enough force into the ground to be able to come out the bottom of the squat. So if that's the case, then we gotta look at, okay, when is it acceptable, when is it not? And there's four things I want you to consider. The first thing is, what is the intensity of the lift? If you look at most elite Olympic lifters when they're performing a snatch or a clean and jerk, you're probably gonna see some knee valgus. And so it may be that there is an acceptable amount um, when you're pushing it really hard. So if you're doing your one rep max or it's game time and you gotta do that in order to put the weight, then it's probably okay, considering these other variables as well. But now let's say you squat and as soon as you bend your knees, your knees knock together and it's body weight. Well, that's probably not desirable because you're using a, a uh, strategy where there's less range of motion available when the task isn't necessarily uber challenging. So if you're seeing knee valgus in that context, that's probably not desirable. Or even just coming out of the bottom of a body weight squat. That, that strategy should ideally only be reserved for higher level things. And so if you're using it on a lower intensity strategy, you probably have to work on things to minimize valgus under that particular situation. That's one thing. What is the intensity of the lift or the movement? Second thing, can a person hit desirable depth? This goes back to the person who gets valgus as soon as they dip down into the bottom or as soon as they uh, start to dip down into a squat. If you get valgus immediately on your descent and your ascent when it's not much weight relative to your strength or whatnot, then there's probably something that we should work on. You should be able to get an adequate amount of depth because if you can get full depth on a squat, you at least have more available movement to you in your repertoire that can even out the workload distribution across multiple joints, life is good. The third thing is, is the body shape that we're going after desirable? So depending on what squat variation you are looking at, does it meet, meet your standards that you would like to see with a squat? Now, there's going to be individual differences, of course. That goes without saying. But if you're choosing a squat variation where you expect verticality of the pelvis and they're shooting way back and they're not hitting depth, and then they have to use knee valgus in that position to come out the bottom, it's probably not a desirable movement strategy that we want in that particular situation. And then the fourth thing that we're going to look at is, is the client, your supreme clientele, feeling the sensory components that we oh so desire? Meaning, if you have someone and they're performing a squat and they're getting knee valgus and they're saying, hey, coach, or hey, therapist. Do people say that to therapists? No. But they're saying, hey, you, I'm feeling my tensor fasciae in my back during the, the squat variation. That's what you want, right? Well, if that's the case, then, you know, we're using squats to work the quads, glutes, all that stuff. Probably not matching what we want from a movement perspective. So it would behoove us to change that and alter the mechanics in a manner so that's not the case. This is especially true if you got someone who's getting a fair amount of knee pain with squatting. Is that gonna happen from time to time? Sure. Do we want knees to be hurting every single time that you're squatting? Probably not. So it's just something that we want to consider. To summarize this amazing question by my dude, Manuel. Big things, valgus happens at the knees when the pelvis anteriorly orients as a unit. 
that might be needed in some instances to put enough force into the ground so you can ascend out the bottom. Is that bad? We don't know. There's just not enough research either way. How do you know it's appropriate? Depends on the intensity of the lift. Higher intensity, probably more is acceptable. Can a person hit enough depth if you're doing knee valgus at the beginning? Not good. Is the shape that you want during the particular exercise desirable? Yes or no, maybe so. If not, take note of that, change the mechanics needed. And does your client feel what they should be feeling? If they don't, then you probably gotta reevaluate. There's probably something else going on. You might need to change the way that they're performing that task. And if you do those things, knee valgus is going to be either a thing of the past or it's not gonna be the big deal that it sometimes can be. Awesome question, Manuel. The next question comes from Kanal. And here's what Kanal asks. Actually, Kanal demands, make a video on the butt wink. Your wish shall be granted, Kanal. So let's talk about butt wink, folks. What is a butt wink? A butt wink is when the pelvis and the spine posteriorly orient as a unit in order to increase the vertical displacement of that person's body. Let me unpack that a little bit for you fine folks. So what will happen is as the person descends down into a squat, if they're shooting the hips way back and they still have to change levels and move more downward as opposed to backward, what will happen is you'll see a roundedness occur through the lumbar spine just like that. And what that will cause is it'll cause the pelvis to kind of dip slowly, or not slowly, but oftentimes quickly underneath. So it's kind of like a very quick posterior tilt, but it occurs through the, the, the lumbar spine and potentially the thoracic spine as opposed to uh, a, a mechanic just purely through the pelvis itself. And that's basically what a butt wink is. And it's more common in back squats than it is typically in other squat variations. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves ourselves, is butt winking a bad thing? And the answer is, well, it depends. First things first, and it's gonna be a similar song and dance to what we talked about with knee valgus, is we don't really have much research to show whether it's injurious to have a butt wink when you're performing a squat. In fact, there's some evidence showing the contrary, at least at low loads. Under low loads, it actually might be safe to lift with a flexed spine. The, the concern and the issue is we don't have any research with high loads. The other thing is during squatting, it actually may be normal for the lumbar spine to get into some flexion. There's this other study that I'll link in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash common dash squats squat, squat, dash compensations. Common, dash, squat, dash compensations. Check it out, you're gonna have a full blog, everything. Give it a shot. But there's this other study that's going to be linked in the show notes where they looked at the mechanics of the lumbar spine and the sacrum during the barbell back squat. And as soon as the bar went on this person's back, and it, was, it was several people, they did that and they did 50% body weight the lumbar spine became kyphotic, meaning it flexed, as soon as the weight was on the back. Now, we don't know if this behavior rings true when we go to higher loads, and we don't know if this rings true when we're working with incredibly well-trained individuals. These were subjects, I believe they were trainers, actually, who've been training for about a year. So we don't, there's a lot of unknowns with this. But the point being is that it seems as though Flexion, to some extent, is probably going to be unavoidable through the spine when it comes to squatting, and it may not be injurious as we once thought. So if we can't say that flexion and butt winking is necessarily a, a bad thing, and it might even be a normal thing when it comes to squatting, is it something that we want to see on the biomechanics side? Well, it depends. It depends on what squat we're talking about. Because there's a difference between doing something that has more of a posterior load, like a back squat, and an anterior load, like a front squat. The mechanics of both of those squats are different. 
the starting position of the spine in both of those is going to be different. And because of that, there might be certain expectations and things we may see in one variation, a back squat, and compared to another, a front squat. And I'm going to unpack that for you folks because then we can determine which ones are appropriate to see butt wink, which ones are not. So, general rule of thumb with squatting, the way I'm going to define squatting for you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people, and the way we're going to differentiate it from a hinge is if I'm squatting, I want vertical pelvic displacement. What that means is when I squat with my son, we want to see the pelvis drop down and drop up. You want it to be relatively up and down like that. What I don't necessarily want is the pelvis shooting backwards like this. That's more of a deadlift, right? That's how I'm differentiating a hinge from a squat. Hinge is more vertical displacement of the pelvis in comparison to a deadlift, which you're shooting the hips back. That's your knee dominant versus quad dominant thing, but looking at it from a biomechanical lens. At the pelvis, with if I have vertical displacement in order to make that happen, if we're assuming that I have relative motion preserved and I'm not having to lock things in place, the sacrum is going to be more counter nutated or tipped backwards if I want vertical displacement. If I want horizontal displacement, sacrum has to nutate. That's the difference between a squat and a hinge. Now let's look at what the position is going to be of the spine when it comes to a back squat first. And with a back squat, the barbell is going to be on your back. So now think folks, if the barbell is on my back, what's gonna happen to the thorax? Well, if I got to rinse my shoulders back like this, there's going to be more concentric tension, compression, or uh, contraction, shortening of posterior musculature. So the upper back is going to be flatter, like that. That's going to shove the thorax forward, which if the thorax is shoved forward, there's going to be more anterior expansion available. Now, folks, the curves that we see and the thoracic spine, which is blue on Ted, are the same curves that we see at the sacrum. So if you look at normal, with scare quotes, um, positioning of the spine, generally the thoracic spine is more kyphotic. The sacrum is also kyphotic. And generally, whatever happens at the thorax is going to be mirrored at the sacrum. So if the thorax is pushed forward and it's more flat, compressed, concentric, we're going to see the same song and dance at the pelvis and the sacrum, which would be, folks, nutation at the sacrum. So if the sacrum is nutating, then that means with a back squat, you're going to get more horizontal or posterior displacement when you descend in the squat because you're prepositioned towards being mutated. But now here's the interesting thing. Again, if we go back to that study that shows that the lumbar spine becomes kyphotic as soon as the bar is on your back. Well, guess what, folks? If I have a pelvis that has more of that mutated position, but the task that I'm asking my person to do is, well, okay, I want you to be mutated, but I also want you to drop straight down, Charlie Brown. What you gonna do about it? Well, the answer is I might have to actually make the lumbar spine kyphotic or flexed in order to achieve that verticality that's needed during a squat. And so because of that, it actually might be normal and more common to see a butt wink occur on the squat, the back squat that is. And the reason why is because I'm already starting from a position where I'm more biased to displace horizontally and not vertically. And so what may have to happen is when you hit that certain point where you can't go back any further and shorter, you got to get low, you might have to be able to create more lumbar flexion to be able to go all the way down. And the reason why that is, is because when you have more of a nutated position, it's hard to achieve counter nutation. And so you have to pick up the motion somewhere in order to get the verticality. And that would be by simply posteriorly orienting the spine to be able to complete the task. So with a back squat, given that 
We start in a kyphotic position through the lumbar spine and that we're asking someone where the bias is because of the positioning more posteriorly oriented, meaning that they're gonna be pushing their hips backward, but we want them to go down, they're probably going to need some degree of butt wink in order to make that happen. So with a back squat, you're probably going to have some degree of butt wink and that's acceptable. How much is acceptable? We go back to a lot of the things that we talked about in the previous question. Does it hit some biomechanical stuff that we think is important that we should see on a squat? Like, are they staying up and down? Are they, uh, you, you know, is, is it with good technique? Are they maintaining an efficient bar path? One, so does it reach motor competency? And then the second thing is, does it feel good? If you're getting TFL and back pain and knee pain and you, you know, I don't know, injure everything doing the back squat, then it's probably too much butt wink and you might need to do some things to address that. So perhaps in that case, you might need to be able to teach them to expand things more posteriorly. So you could work on more counter nutation based squatting, among other things, just to see if you can give them a little bit more space so that's less deleterious when they're performing that particular squat. So you use those as your guide. Now contrast that, folks. So back squat, butt wink, probably okay. But what about something more front-loaded? Let's look at the mechanics that we would see during a front-loaded squat and see what that's about. So if I got the weight on the front, folks, that's gonna allow for more posterior expansion because I don't have a bar pushing my thorax forward. In fact, the front load, whether it's zercher or front squat, is going to allow me to sit further back and expand the thorax posteriorly, meaning I'm gonna have more range of motion available to maintain a vertical position, at least through the spine. Well, folks, if the thoracic spine is essentially the sacrum, what is the posteriorly expanded position of the sacrum? Get ready to follow your boy to counter mutation nation because the sacrum is gonna be able to counter nutate now with this. And if the sacrum's counter nutated, remember, that's going to allow for more vertical displacement to happen when I'm performing an anterior loaded squat, like a front squat. Why is it that when you do a front squat, you're generally a lot more upright in comparison to a back squat? That's why. It's because of the way the bar changes the shape of your body to be able to complete the task. So if I have a move where I know I should be able to keep verticality and I don't have something like a bar that's pushing me backwards, would I expect as much of a butt wink? You'd hope not because you're already pre-positioned to be able to achieve an appropriate amount of flexion to get up and down. So if you're seeing someone who butt winks on an anterior loaded squat, that's probably less desirable because what they're telling you is they're saying, hey, coach, hey, therapist, I know you got me anterior loaded, and that's cool, yo, I dig it. But what's going on is I ain't about that life. I wanna be posteriorly displacing my pelvis because I'm gonna just anteriorly tilt the F out of my stuff. That's gonna allow me to shoot back. Yo, 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 I get it. I know you want me to go up and down, but don't worry, I got you. I'm just gonna create this aggressive lumbar flexion on the way down, we should be good, right? Wrong. This person should have a significantly reduced amount of butt wink if the squat is anterior loaded because the bias is towards having the, the flexion-based posture distributed across more of the spine and the pelvis. So butt wink is less acceptable when the load is anterior. And that's because it should be easier to maintain the spinal flexion needed to be able to maintain verticality on the squat. And so if you can't do that, it's actually a very similar fix to what you would see on the back squat. You need to teach your supreme clientele to get more posterior expansion. So that could be working on higher depth uh, flexion, that could be doing things such as like uh, the drunken turtle, which might encourage a bit more rounding through the spine. Uh, that could be doing things on single leg, like a step up, which could also encourage being able to keep that tucked position uh, during the squats. And, and that's really the long and the short of it when it comes to the butt wink. So to summarize, this unbelievable question is a butt wink is basically just a large posterior orientation of the pelvis and the spine in total. We would expect less of that to occur during 
front-loaded base squats because the mechanics are biased towards being more vertical, and we would expect more of it during more back squats or posterior loaded squats because the mechanics in that particular task are biased towards more horizontal pelvic displacement. It can be too much if that person is not performing the squat to the standards that we would like, one. The second thing would be if it hurts or if they're not feeling the areas that we need them to feel or they're feeling undesirable areas. So if we can do things in either case to encourage more posterior expansion, so that or as little of that aggressive butt wink is allowed, then we're probably going to be do right by our clients. They're probably gonna be feeling good with their squat and they'll have an appropriate amount of butt wink with the desired task at hand. Unbelievable question. Now folks, you might be wondering, well, Zach, that sounds really cool, but I'm not used to coaching a squat with that amount of verticality. And, you know, rumor has it that when you squat like that, the quads just get absolutely torched, which is the case. And we've seen some good things improve movement-wise. So how can I learn how to do that? Well, folks, the answer is Human Matrix, my seminar. I would say you could come to the one in Wyckoff next week, but we sold out, folks. So the next one that is available, if you want to come check it out, and the links will be in the show notes, zackcouples.com forward slash common dash squat dash compensation is October 23rd and 24th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That one is confirmed happening, uh, selling quite a bit. So please get tickets while you still can. November 6th and 7th, Charlotte, North Carolina. November 20th and 21st in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And the last one of the year, December 4th and 5th in wonderful Las Vegas, Nevada at your homeboy's spot. Elevate Sports Performance and Healthcare. Please check them out. I would love to see you there. The last question comes from Mark. And here's what Mark asks. I often hear about the sticking point in the squat. This usually refers to the ability to come up out of the squat. What about the sticking point going down? Oftentimes, going past parallel is difficult. I see you and others use a heel elevated strategy to help with these compensations, inhalation based strategy. I find that a light weight held straight out in front does the same thing. An effortless, smooth, fluid, perfect, full squat with the knees pointing forward and not needing to go out. Just doing the squat in this arm position doesn't have the same effect as the light weight. Can you talk about reasons for this a little? I won't do it a little, Mark. I'm gonna do it a lot. So let's dive into the sticking point. So what is the sticking point? And you can have it both going down or going up. Basically, you have two forces opposing one another. And folks, it's not the light side, the dark side. I'm talking about forces that are pushing you down towards the ground, gravity, this could be the weight, this could be internal forces allowing you to, to absorb the, those downward forces, that's one. And then the second thing is upward forces, meaning the amount of force that you're putting into the ground to stay upright. So if you live on planet Earth, you are always putting force into the ground. If you weren't, you'd fall on the ground all day, every day. Since you likely don't do that unless you spend a little bit too much time in the Las Vegas Strip, chances are you are putting force into the ground. The sticking point, either going down or going up, is when the amount of force applied in these two situations basically meet together and we're at a standstill. So in the case of someone who can't break parallel in the squat, that's because the amount of downward force, whether it's with gravity, the load, what have you, cannot overcome the force that you are putting into the ground, which is more, folks, internal rotation. So because of that, because you're continuing to put force in the, gr in the ground and you can't absorb the forces that are pushing you down, you're stuck at parallel. And then you can't break parallel in the squat. Conversely, if the sticking point is coming up out of the squat, now you have a situation where you're putting as much force into the ground as humanly possible, but the forces that are pushing you down, like the man, AKA gravity, the weight, everything else, your internal forces, et cetera, et cetera, that's still trying to push you back down. 
And so you might not be able to produce an adequate amount of force to overcome that force. And so then you're stuck in the sticking point. And eventually, you might be able to break through and finish the squat. Life is good. The angels sing, birds chirp. Or you get plastered and your peeps got to help you up out the bottom. That's all that's going on with the sticking point is you either can't absorb enough of the downward forces to get all the way down and you're stuck, or you can't push against those forces on the way up and you're stuck. And so in either of those cases, we have to teach our supreme clientele to be able to break through those sticking points. So if you have someone who has a sticking point at parallel and they can't break through that, you have to increase the absorptive capabilities of that particular person descending into the squat. The absorptive position in the pelvis for a full squat is counter nutation of the sacrum. So anything that encourages more posterior expansion in that particular situation and increases space is going to be helpful at achieving that. So that could be, as, um, as Mark alluded to, with heels elevation and reaching forward, both of those bias the body towards encouraging more posterior expansion to increase absorptive capabilities. When you elevate the heels, the femurs go into more external rotation because plantar flexion and inversion is an external rotation action that occurs at the leg. If you don't believe me, go ahead and while you're sit seated, plantar flexion invert, you'll see where your femur goes. That's going to encourage more of a counter position at the pelvis, which is going to allow for more absorption. If you reach the weight out and you have that counterweight, that physical weight allows you to shift your center of mass backward, especially if you do a low reach in the zero to 60 range, which is going to encourage your ability to create more space in your upper back and your upper thorax, which is going to increase the absorption position within your body. It's gonna make more space for you to absorb the forces that are pushing you down, and you're going to not be pushing into the ground as hard. And that's why those tasks can be useful at helping you come out the bottom. Just like if you used a band assistance on the way up out of a squat, so perhaps you're doing a back squat and you got uh, two bands hooked up and it's slowing down the descent, but then when you come up, the bands assist you on the way up. Well, folks, that gives you a little bit extra force to then propel out of the bottom so that way you get past the sticking point. So you've essentially got a little bit of assistance to help you come out the bottom so you can overcome the forces of gravity and, and the weight. And that's all that it is. You just have to be able to teach either more absorption if your sticking point is going down, or you have to be able to teach more production if you're coming up. Production-based things are gonna be things that drive more internal rotation. So that could be um, you know, doing box squats where you're completely relaxing and then coming out of the bottom. That could be utilizing split squat different exercises. Lots of different things to be able to achieve those tasks. And so the big thing with sticking points is you either have to increase absorption if you're limited going down or increase production if you can't break coming up. And if you do those things, you're going to break past your sticking points and no one will mess with you. Unbelievable question, Mark. The next question comes from Michaela. And here's what she asks. What can you do to get better at keeping the upper body back during a front squat when the tendency is to want to hinge the mid back during the descent? Even though the front squat allows more posterior expansion in comparison to the back squat, there's still some degree of anterior expansion that's allowed with the front squat. And the reason why that is, is because generally when you're front squatting, you're reaching the elbows forward at about 90 degrees. 90 degrees of shoulder flexion is promoting internal rotation at the humerus. Internal rotation at the humerus is associated with anterior expansion or putting air into the front of the chest. If you see someone as they're going down and they flex down and hinge, what's going on is what we talked about in the first question, which is 
you're asking that person, you're saying, hey person, I want you to internally rotate through your thorax, so go ahead and do that. And they might not be able to attain the relative motion in the front rack position to allow that to happen. And so they might be like, okay, well, if you want me to do that, that's fine. But the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna just hinge forward and anteriorly tilt the thorax because that allows me to pick up more internal rotation. But it does so at the cost of losing relative motion between the bones. So the fix, assuming that you're able to get up into the position with uh, full external rotation capabilities. If you're uncertain about that, actually using a reaching ramp squat in a low reach position could be a good way to assess that. If you can't get all the way down, you probably need to work on that first. But you would choose things that would actually bias more anterior expansion to allow you to get into that position. So that could be quadruped breathing on, on one arm. That could be useful if you're a narrow infrasternal angle. You could use dumbbell pullovers if you're more of a wide ISA person. Both of those will encourage internal rotation capabilities and that hopefully it will allow you to be less hingy on the front squat. Awesome question. Kayla's next question. What is the best option for a, a squat option for a narrow ISA if the goal is hypertrophy, but also enhance movement options, not make asymmetries worse? Ooh. Um, well, so here's the thing. Um, with that, you want to choose whatever variation is going to allow them to maintain verticality in the squat because that's gonna enhance movement options. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing when it comes to hypertrophy is you need to create enough me mechanical tension and you need volume. So you need a variation that's going to allow them to um, do both of those at the same time. And what I would choose that I think is probably gonna get the best of both worlds where you're gonna get appropriate loading so that way you can build muscle mass, but then also you're shooting, you're, you're putting yourself in the best position to allow for pelvic verticality to occur. It's actually probably a, a heels elevated half field squat. So with that, you could use a safety bar. Um, that's probably the best. I actually, we have a transformer bar at Elevate, which is awesome. I actually like, I love that thing. I probably wouldn't squat any other way. Um, but the only downside is the half field's a little awkward in that one. But what a half field squat is basically folks, is you got your safety bar on and you're hanging on to the, uh, the rack in front of you or a bar even, because that allows you to get forward reach, which will allow you to get that posterior displacement. And then you can rep out squats that way. That might be, if you can work someone up to that position, and that's assuming that they're well-trained, like if it's just your beginner, like don't use the bazooka if a uh, pistol will do the job. Meaning if you got someone who's just starting out training, they're gonna be able to get good changes within the first year, probably just doing a goblet squat, maybe even a two kettlebell front squat. So use that. But if you got someone who's a little bit more well-trained, then something like a Hatfield squat could be really useful in that regard. And that would probably be the go-to that I would say if you wanna try to maximize the best of both worlds. Um, and the nice thing about it too is it's less technically intensive compared to say a front squat or a uh, even a Zercher squat, because both of those will have some loading limits to some extent. Uh, Jordan Joshua 88, any go-to mobility drills for overhead squatting? Whew, that's a good one, man, because I don't really coach a lot of overhead squatting. I, I, I don't utilize many of the traditional Olympic lifts. Uh, it's not that they're bad, I just am not the most adept at coaching them. And I would, um, you know, rather, you know, I'm better at coaching plyometrics and, uh, you know, maybe doing more like the kettlebell based ones uh, as opposed to those. So for my population, I don't see much utility in overhead squatting for that reason, just because it does require a fair amount of flexibility. But the, the two key things that you need is you need to encourage things that would get you more posterior expansion, at least in the pelvis, and then the overhead position is actually a position where you're getting internal rotation through the humeri. And so making sure you get anterior expansion in that particular situation is gonna be really useful. So things that I would potentially consider would be bar hangs, um, because that's gonna allow for more anterior expansion of the thorax in that internally rotated position. Doing row to row, different row variations will actually encourage more anterior expansion in the uppermost segments of the thorax. And that's because when you do humeral extension, the clavicle has to anteriorly uh, rotate, which is gonna promote expansion up in the manubrium. 
And the last thing I would say would just be continuing to practice the overhead squat. You could use different box squats variation in order to attain depth. Those would be the things I would initially think about. But uh, again, I, I do want to preface that it's not a, a movement task that I go to quite frequently. But assess your peeps and, and see what they need because there could be a lot of reasons why they might not be able to get into that position. I think, folks, that's a good stopping point for us today. I want to thank you, beautiful, sexy, and outstanding people for asking so many questions and tuning in. I love and appreciate each and every one, one of you. Again, Human Matrix, sign up for it, zackcouples.com forward slash seminars. Um, next one's going to be, that's available is in Philly next month. So please come check it out and then just go to zackcouples.com for uh, anything else that you want. Show notes and all that are going to be there. Give it a shot. It's going to enhance your learning. The best way to learn things is to see it multiple times. So if you're watching it live, I encourage you, watch the HD version because I'll add some other graphics into the mix. There's going to be a dope blog post right there for you. There's going to be the podcast. Listen to me everywhere. Take me every which way. Definitely check all that out. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been a beautiful, sexy, outstanding audience. And I hope that you keep it real but not take some where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.